Chapter 4 of Savarine's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Mossman. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. Savarine's Disappearance. Chapter 4 Gone. At precisely eight o'clock in the evening of this identical Monday, July 17th, 1854, old Jonathan Perry sat tranquilly smoking his pipe at the door of the toll gate two miles north of Millbrook. The atmosphere was too warm to admit of the wearing of any great display of apparel, and the old man sat hatless and coatless on a sort of settle at the threshold. He was an inveterate old gossip, and was acquainted with the business of everybody in the neighborhood. He knew all about the bargain entered into between Savarine and Squire Harrington, and how it was to be consummated on the following day. Savarine, when riding townwards that morning, had informed him of the ostensible purpose of his journey, and it now suddenly occurred to the old man to wonder why the young farmer had not returned home. While he sat there pondering, the first stroke of the town bell proclaiming the hour was borne upon his ear. Before the ringing had ceased, he caught the additional sound of a horse's hoofs rapidly advancing up the road. "'Ah,' said he to himself, "'here he comes. I reckon his wife will be apt to give him fits for being so late.' In another moment the horseman drew up before him, but only to exchange a word of greeting, as the gate was thrown wide open and there was nothing to bar his progress. The venerable gatekeeper had conjectured right. It was Savarine on his black mare. "'Well, Jonathan, a nice evening.' remarked the young farmer. "'Yes, Mr. Savarine, a lovely night. You've had a long day of it in town. They'll be anxious about you at home. Did you find the money all right, as you expected?' "'Oh, the money was there right enough, and I've got it in my pocket. I had some words with that conceited puppy Shuttleworth at the bank. He's altogether too big for his place, and I can tell you he'll have the handling of no more money of mine.' And then, for about the twentieth time within the last few hours, he recounted the particulars of his interview with the bank clerk. The old man expressed his entire concurrence in Savarine's estimate of Shuttleworth's conduct. "'I have to pay the gate money into the bank on the first of every month,' he remarked, "'and that young feller always acts as if he felt too uppish to touch it. I wonder you didn't drop into him.' "'Oh, I wasn't likely to do that,' was the reply. "'But I gave him a bit of my mind, and I told him it'd be a long time before I darkened the doors of his shop again. And so it will.' I'd sooner keep my bit of money, when I have any, in the clock case at home. There's never any housebreaking hereabouts. Jonathan responded by saying that, in so far as he knew, there hadn't been a burglary for many a year. But all the same, he continued, I shouldn't like to keep such a sum as four hundred pound about me even for a single night. No more I shouldn't like to carry such a pot of money home in the night time, even if nobody knew as I had it on me. Ride you home, Mr. Savarine, and hide it away in some safe place till tomorrow morning. That's my advice. And very good advice it is, Jonathan, was the response. I'll act upon it without more words. Good night. And so saying, Savarine continued his course homeward at a brisk trot. The old man watched him as he sped away up the road, but could not keep him in view more than half a minute or so, as by this time the light of day had wholly departed. He lighted his pipe, which had gone out during the conversation, and resumed his seat on the saddle. Scarcely had he done so, ere he heard the clatter of horses' hoofs moving rapidly toward the gate from the northward. Why, said he to himself, this must be Savarine coming back again. What's the matter now, I wonder? But this time he was out in his conjecture. When the horseman reached the gate, he proved to be not Savarine, but mine host Lapierre, mounted on his fast-trotting nag, Count Frontenac a name irreverently abbreviated by the sportsmen of the district into Fronty. The rider drew up with a boisterous whoa, and reached out towards the gatekeeper, a five-cent piece by way of toll, saying as he did so, Well, Mr. Perry, how goes everything with you? Oh, good evening, Mr. Lapierre. I didn't know you till you spoke. My eyesight's getting dimmer every day, I think. Bound for town? Yes, I want to see what has caught Mr. Safarine. He went to town early this morning to see about some money matters, and he promised to be back in a couple of hours, but he ain't back yet. Mrs. Safarine got so uneasy about him tonight that she came up to my place and pegged me to ride down and hunt him up. I suppose you saw him on his way down? Saw him? On his way down? What are you talking about? Didn't you meet him just now? Meet who? Savarine. 
Where? When? Why, not two minutes ago. He passed through here on his way home just before you came up. How long before? How long? Why, don't I tell you, not two minutes. He hadn't hardly got out of sight when I heard your horse's feet on the stones, and I thought it was him a-coming back again. You must have met him on this side of Stolliver's. Then followed further explanations on the part of old Jonathan, who recounted his conversation he had just had with Savarine. Well, of course, the key to the situation was not hard to find. Savarine had left the toll gate and proceeded northward not more than two or three minutes before Lapierre, riding southward along the same road, had reached the same point. The two had not encountered each other. Therefore, one of them had deviated from the road. There had been no deviation on the part of Lapierre, so the deviator must necessarily have been Savarine. But the space of time which had elapsed was too brief to admit of the latter's having ridden more than a hundred yards or thereabouts. The only outlet from the road within four times that distance was the gateway leading into Stolliver's house. The explanation, consequently, was simple enough. Savarine had called in at Stolliver's. QED. Strange, though, that he had said nothing to old Jonathan about his intention to call there. He had ridden off as though intent upon getting home without delay, and hiding his money away in a safe place for the night. And, come to think of it, it was hard to understand what possible reason he could have had for calling at Stolliver's. He had never had any business or social relations of any kind with Stolliver, and in fact the two had merely a nodding acquaintance. Still another strange thing was that Savarine should have taken his horse inside the gate, as there was a tying post outside, and he could not have intended to make any prolonged stay. However, there was no use raising difficult problems which could doubtless be solved by a moment's explanation. It was absolutely certain that Savarine was at Stolliver's because he could not possibly have avoided meeting Lapierre if he had not called there. It was Lapierre's business to find him and take him home. Accordingly, the landlord of the Royal Oak turned his horse's head and cantered back up the road till he reached the front of Stolliver's place. Stolliver and his two boys were sitting out on the front fence, having emerged from the house only a moment before. They had been working in the fields until past sundown and had just risen from a late supper. Old Stolliver was in the habit of smoking a pipe every night after his evening meal, and in pleasant weather he generally chose to smoke it out of doors, as he was doing this evening, although the darkness had fallen. Lapierre, as he drew rein, saw the three figures on the fence, but could not, in the darkness, distinguish one from another. "'Is that Mr. Stolliver? he asked. "'Yes, who be you?' was the ungracious response, delivered in a gruff tone of voice. Old Stolliver was a boorish, cross-grained customer, who paid slight regard to the amenities and did not show to advantage in conversation. "'Don't you know me? I am Mr. Lapierre.' Oh, Mr. Lapierre, eh? Been a warm day? Yes. Has Mr. Safarine gone? Mr. who? Mr. Safarine. Was he not here just now? Here? What fur? The landlord was by this time beginning to feel a little disgusted at the man's boorish incivility. Will you be so good as to tell me, he asked, if Mr. Safarine has been here? Not as I know of. Hain't seen him. Lapierre was astounded. He explained the state affairs to his interlocutor, who received the communication with his wonted stolidity, and proceeded to light his pipe, as much as to say that the affair was none of his funeral. Well, he remarked with exasperating coolness, I guess you must have passed him on the road. We ain't been out here a more than a minute or two. Nobody ain't passed since then. This seemed incredible. Where, then, was Savarine? Had he sunk into the bowels of the earth, or gone up, black mare and all, in a balloon? Of course it was all nonsense about the landlord having passed him on the road without seeing or hearing anything of him, but what other explanation did the circumstances admit of? At any rate, there was nothing for Lapierre to do but ride back to Savarine's house and see if he had arrived there. Yes, one other thing might be done. He might return to the toll-gate and ascertain whether Jonathan Perry was certain as to the identity of the man from whom he had parted a few minutes before. So Count Frontenac's head was once more turned southward. A short trot brought him again to the toll-house. The gatekeeper was still sitting, smoking at the door. A moment's conference with him was sufficient to convince Lapierre that there could be no question of mistaken identity. "'Why,' said Jonathan, "'I know Mr. Severine as well as I know my right hand. And then didn't he tell me about his row with Shuttleworth, and that he had the four hundred pounds in his pocket? Why, dark as it was, I noticed the scar on his cheek when he was talking about it. "'I say, Mrs., look here,' he called in a louder tone, whereupon his wife presented herself at the threshold. "'Now,' resumed the old man, 
Just tell Mr. Lapierre whether you saw Mr. Savarine talking to me a few minutes since, and whether you saw him ride off up the road just before Mr. Lapierre came down. Did you, or did you not? Mrs. Perry's answer was decisive, and at the same time conclusive as to the facts. She had not only seen Savarine sitting on his black mare at the door immediately after the town bell ceased ringing for eight o'clock, but she had listened to the conversation between him and her husband, and had heard pretty nearly every word. Lapierre cross-examined her, and found that her report of the interview exactly corresponded with what he had already heard from old Jonathan. "'Why,' said she, "'there is no more doubt of its being Mr. Savarine than there is of that gatepost being there on the roadside. "'Very good advice it is,' says he, and I'll act upon it without more words. Then he said good night, and off he went up the road. "'Depend upon it, Mr. Lapierre, you have missed him somehow in the darkness, and he's safe and sound at home by this time.' "'Yes, yes, Mr. Lapierre, not a doubt on it,' resumed old Jonathan. "'You have a-passed him on the road without seeing him. "'It was dark, and you were both in a hurry. "'I've heard a lot of stranger things, know that.' "'Lapierre couldn't see it. "'He knew well enough that it was no more possible for him "'to pass a man on horseback on that narrow highway "'on a clear night without seeing him, "'more especially when he was out for the express purpose "'of finding that very man, "'than it was possible for him to serve out une petite vieille French brandy and mistake for a gill of Holland's. The facts, however, seemed to be wholly against him, as he bade the old couple a despondent good night and put Count Frontenac to his mettle. He stayed not for brook, there was a brook a short distance up the road, and he stopped not for a stone, but tore along at a breakneck pace as though he was riding for a wager. In five minutes he reached Savarine's front gate. Mrs. Savarine was waiting there, on the lookout for her husband. No, of course he had not got home. She had neither seen nor heard anything of him, and was by this time very uneasy. You may be sure that her anxiety was not lessened when she heard the strange tale which Lapierre had to tell her. Even then, however, she did not give up the hope of her husband's arrival some time during the night. Lapierre promised to look in again in an hour or two, and passed on to his own place, where he regaled the little company he found there with the narrative of his evening's exploits. Before bedtime, the story was known all over the neighborhood. End of chapter 4